The church in Antioch has fasted and prayed. They have sought God's face and God's will. And as a result, they are called to set apart Barnabas and Saul, their beloved mentors, for a missionary journey, which they do straight away. And I'm impressed by their obedience, while Luke, the writer of this text, reports it as a matter of fact, laying hands on them. They sent them off. From Antioch, Saul and Barnabas would make about a 16-mile trek to the coast where they will board a ship, and then they will cross the sea to get to the island of Cyprus. This is a homecoming for Barnabas. We read in Acts chapter 4, he was a Levite from the island of Cyprus. And among other things, this morning's text tells us how the gospel got out there. Evangelizing this island was part of God's plan, the work that he had in mind when he had the church set apart, Barnabas and Saul. When they got to Cyprus, they started preaching in the synagogues in the pattern of Jesus, who went first to the lost house of Israel, and in the approach Saul would later describe in Romans 1.16. When he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. When they had gone through this entire island from the east coast, where they landed, to the west coast in a city of Paphos, they came across an interesting character. We know he's interesting because Luke describes him in three different ways. He is a Jewish false prophet magician. <laughs> he is a dirty, rotten scoundrel. <laughs> That's what he's saying. No, nothing inherently wrong with being Jew Jewish, right? Nothing inherently condemning about being Jewish, but think this through with me, if you would. For a Jew to engage in sorcery, which is forbidden, obviously, in, in the Hebrew scriptures, is an indication that while he may be an ethnic Jew, he has fallen far from his ancestral faith. And as to being a false prophet, we know that's the worst kind of prophet. It means that this fellow doesn't speak the truth. It means that he is a fraud. And as a magician, he's a trickster a manipulator of the senses, not a pull-the-rabbit-out-of-your-hat kind of magician that we might be used to, but a dabbler in black arts, one who deceives, one who invokes forces of evil to perpetuate his deceit. It's interesting, and it's ironic, the name given him is Bar-Jesus, which means son of Jesus son of Joshua. Bar-Jesus, who was also called Elymas, had an inn with a Roman-appointed head of Cyprus, a man with a very Roman name, Sergius Paulus. And Luke tells us he was both intelligent and curious. When Sergius Paulus learns about these two visitors to his city, he summonses them to come to him that he might hear the word of God. The message of the gospel that Saul and Barnabas had been sent to preach. Which brings us to the first point from this text regarding the gospel. Some people will be open to the good news of Jesus. Some people will be open to the good news of Jesus. Do you get that impression at all in your circle of friends or do you get that impression at all from the the news you read or the news feed you have or the current narrative about Christianity or the way that believers are being characterized in this society, you may come to believe that people aren't interested in hearing about Jesus. In fact, we probably should kind of keep it quiet. So that at least we don't get in trouble and people don't think that we're nut jobs. <laughs> I'm telling you, some people will be open to the good news of Jesus. They simply will be. You might be surprised to know that an evangelism explosion survey 
taken uh, by LifeWay Research just last February, found out that Americans are widely receptive to spiritual conversations in a variety of settings. 51% of Americans said they are interested to know why some are so devoted to their religious faith. They want to know why some of their friends are, are so devoted to the religious faith. And that 51% that included 60% of those who said they were unaffiliated, had no religious connection or conviction whatsoever, didn't care, didn't think about these things, but still a, a lot of them were interested to know why does it mean so much to you? One conclusion of the study is this. Americans are curious about the religious devotion of others and are willing to discuss the topic. But most say they rarely have conversations about faith with their Christian friends. Some people will be open to the good news of Jesus. So let's not be afraid to share it. The light isn't lit, so it can be hit, hit under a basket, is it? And we are light. And Jesus said that. You're the light of the world. Let your good work shine in such a way that your Father in heaven will be glorified. Preach, teach, tell, go. Some people, despite what others may want you to believe, will be open to hearing the good news of Jesus. In our passage for this morning, a high-ranking official was exactly that. But we learn quickly the man who had his ear was not so receptive to spiritual things and not so happy that Sergius Paulus wanted to hear from Saul and Barnabas. Verse 8, but Elymas the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them. Literally translated, that means he stood against them. He had, he had nothing good in them, saw nothing good in them. Didn't believe in what Saul and Barnabas were doing. Didn't have an interest in necessarily what Saul and Barnabas were saying. He stood against it. And that brings us to the second point. Obviously, in the text regarding the gospel, some people will be opposed to hearing the good news of Jesus. Okay, Some people will be open to it, but some people will be opposed to the good news of Jesus. Why do you think that anyone would be opposed to hearing about Jesus Christ, about forgiveness of sin, about salvation, about deliverance, redemption, rescue? Why do you think anybody would be opposed to that in any way, on principle or just intuitively, which is what it seems to be happening here with Elymas? Well, I can give you a big reason that people would be opposed to the gospel, and I think you know this. It's called spiritual warfare. That there is a cosmic battle raging even now and always in this fallen world. That we have a real enemy. And he has plenty of minions to do his work. And he's wandering about like a roaring lion seeking to devour whom he may. This is real stuff. Our enemy will do anything he can to stifle the effectiveness of the gospel. He doesn't necessarily care if you worship him, but he surely doesn't want you worshiping Jesus. He doesn't care if you acknowledge him, but he does not want you to acknowledge Jesus. The truth of spiritual warfare is explained in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. There's a section there about the armor of God. And if you're in Pastor Mike's one-to-one -one Bible reading, if you haven't gotten there, you're going to get there. You're there. They're there. <laughs> Perfect. Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Who are we fighting? What are we fighting? Not people. Not people. Conflict gets personified all the time. 
And people get vilified as a result of that, right? We come to believe that he's a problem. We come to believe that she is a problem. But behind any problem we have with him or with her, behind whatever it is that is causing us trouble, is a spiritual tug of war. See it. Know it. Be ready for it. That's what Ephesians 6 is all about. Put on the full armor of God. And by the way, the time to put on the armor of God is when? Now. Before the fight. A little clunky in the middle of the fight to try to put everything on. <laughs> put it on now. That's what Paul's saying. Be ready. Why do I need to be ready? Because you're in the middle of a battle. Doesn't feel like I'm in the middle of a battle. You're in the middle of a battle. Be ready. It is now and it is happening. It is a spiritual war. So you better believe that if you're going to proclaim the name of Jesus, some people are going to come in opposition of that because they belong to the evil one. Because the forces of evil are at work in this world. And we're going to see this pattern again and again and again as we make our way finishing up the book of Acts. The devil doesn't want people to get saved. And so those who will speak the gospel, who will hold fast to Jesus, who will proclaim the truth, ought to expect some opposition. Ought to expect that some people will absolutely stand against you. This opposition, by the way, does not necessarily mean that one is in the wrong place or doing the wrong thing. We get an idea sometimes that if we're in God's will, it will all be smooth sailing. It will, it will always go right. God will bless us in every way, and we won't encounter any hardship, and we won't, we won't encounter any problems because we're in God's will. So let me ask you, friend, just from this text, are Saul and Barnabas in the will of God? Absolutely, they're in the will of God. This church at Antioch fasted and prayed to sought God. And what does God say? Set apart for me these two. Why? For the work that I have called them to. This is part of the work. This is part of what God wanted to happen. And that is what is happening. Saul and Barnabas are exactly where the Holy Spirit wants them to be, doing exactly what they were supposed to do, what they were set apart to do, and they encounter resistance. And they come up against it. And you may too. Doesn't mean you're in the wrong place. Doesn't mean you're doing the wrong thing. Might actually mean you're exactly where you need to be doing exactly what you ought to be doing. We just see through a glass dimly, don't we? We can never know exactly what God is up to. Not only was Elymas opposed to Saul and Barnabas, opposed to the gospel, he didn't want Sergius Paulus to receive Jesus either. So Luke tells us he was actively seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Verse 9, but Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. So we have already debunked one myth associated with Paul when it comes to the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus. You remember what that myth was? There is no horse. <laughs> so let's debunk another one. Not a major issue, but definitely I think worth clearing up because it is widely believed that Saul, when he was converted, became or had his name changed to Paul. And God has done that in the past. And you may believe that to this day. That may be what you were taught. Remember, Abram became Abraham. Jacob became Israel. But that is not what's going on here. At least if that is what's going on, there's absolutely no scriptural evidence for it. You may have noticed that after the Damascus Road experience, the apostle continues to be referred to as Saul. Pretty much until we get to this place in the story. Eleven times in the text, he is known as Saul following his conversion. Indeed, the Holy Spirit calls him Saul when he speaks to the church in Antioch and says to set him apart. And this, we know, is years, years after the Damascus 
experience. The explanation for the two names is actually a simple one. Saul is his Hebrew name. Along the lines of Israel's first king, remember that? Who was also from the tribe of Benjamin, like Paul was. So Saul is his Hebrew name, and Paul is his Greek name. His name has not changed because his life has, but just practically speaking, because of where he will be ministering. We are not told that his name was changed from Saul, but that he was also called Paul. And that is the name that uh, he is best known for, and that is the name primarily he's going to have for the rest of the book. So here we are at a pivot point in, in Acts 13, and Saul will henceforth be called Paul, which we pick up actually, Lord willing, next week in verse 13, starts right out. Now Paul and his companions. So to be clear, Saul is known by two names, and moving ahead in the story, he's going to be referred to as Paul. More important than that little point of clarification, however, is the showdown that's about to happen on Cyprus. As Paul confronts his adversary, if this were a movie, the soundtrack at this point, the music would change to something much more ominous. And we would probably zero in on the Apostle Paul squinting his eyes, <laughs> doing his best Clint Eastwood before Clint Eastwood has ever even thought of. There you go. Staring down Elemas. You son of the devil, he says. You enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Elemas, bar Jesus, son of Jesus, is not that at all, is he? And Paul points it out. He is, according to Paul, a son of the devil. He's a child of Satan, bar diabolos. Well, that might seem kind of harsh. That might, like, uh, that might seem like quite a thing to throw at somebody, it, and it may seem harsh, but it shouldn't be surprising. Because you know this, beloved, I hope you know this. According to the Bible, there really are only two sorts of people in this world. There are children of God, and there are children of the devil. There are those who are for Jesus, and there are those who are against him. That is how Jesus divides it. He who is not for me is what? Against me. So there is no neutral here. You're either in or you're out, but you can't, there's no line that you can walk. You're either a child of God or you're a child of devil. Everyone belongs to God or belongs to God's enemy. That's, that's how the Bible pictures it. Which, by the way, is why it is so absolutely important that you are certain who you belong to. You must know. You are a child of God. You must know whose child you are. Paul's words might seem harsh in our world. We live in a live and let live world, don't we? And yet, he's only following the pattern of Jesus. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees in a very like matter. We read about it in John chapter 8, in particular John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil, he says to the Pharisees. They've been acting pretty badly, and he called them on it. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and the father of lies. You're of your father, the devil, and you're doing the same thing that he always does. Jesus made that observation because of how the Pharisees were treating him, how they resisted him. One expects a child of the devil to act like his father. And that is what Elymas was doing. By seeking to dissuade Sergius Paulus from coming to know the Lord, from believing in Jesus, by attempting to derail the effects of the gospel on the proconsul's life, Elymas made himself an enemy of righteousness. 
And if the way Paul addresses him and the curse that's about to follow seems intense to you, let me remind you again, Jesus pulled no punches when he addressed those who would oppose the gospel and forbid anyone to come to him. Luke chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. Jesus says, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Jesus was very serious with those who would forbid anyone to come to him. And he dealt intensely with them. You see, the enemy of our souls doesn't want people coming to salvation. He does not want people to inherit eternal life. The enemy of our souls is the enemy of humanity wants people to be eternally condemned to hell. And just like his father, the devil, Elymas opposes the very grace of God that Paul and Barnabas have come to Cyprus to extend. And whereas Luke tells us Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit, Elymas is filled with deceit and villainy. He's a trickster. He's a, he has malicious intent. And he's just like the devil. He wants to prevent and pervert and distort and misinterpret and corrupt the straight ways, the right ways of the Lord. That's what the enemy does. And Paul is bold in the way that he confronts this man. And he's bold for one reason, beloved. Catch this, please. Eternal life is serious business. The everlasting status of a soul is worth being bold. Worth being truthful. Worth risking offense. And the one who stands in the way of the salvation of another is himself in danger. And so we see it in this curse, verse 11. And now... Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you'll be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Put yourself there and imagine what that transformation looked like. Immediately. The hand of the Lord is upon you. Well, not long ago, Acts chapter 11, verse 21, we saw the hand of the Lord on the men from Cyprus and Cyrene, men who are preaching the Lord Jesus in Antioch. The hand of the Lord was, in this instance, a hand of blessing. It was a hand of favor, an enabling hand, a helping hand, that same powerful hand for those like Elymas who oppose the work of God, who deceive for selfish gain without regard for eternal consequences. That same hand is a hand of judgment. And God makes Elymas, the one who thinks he sees clearly, to be blind for a time. And he makes the one who tries to veil the light of the gospel with darkness himself live in darkness for a season. And this magician who so desperately wanted to retain that place of power and independence finds himself in the perfect matchless wisdom of God, powerless and dependent. The one who wants to lead others away from Jesus now must be led by others. At that point in the story, we might be applauding <laughs> the just desserts of Elymas. Take that! Oh, come on, tell me. You don't feel that? I feel that. Read that. I want to dance in the end zone. Take that, Elymas! It's, it's, it's deeply satisfying, I think, don't you, when the bad guys get what's coming to them? Oh, come on! <laughs> I know you people! <laughs> Good night! You know it's true. When the villain is deposed, 
when the hero is vindicated. Man, we want to dance, we want to sing, we want to shout. Except, Paul is no hero. And he would never want you to think of him as one. Paul is an object of grace. Once upon a time, and not that far removed from this incident, he was not a magician. He was a murderer. He oversaw the stoning of Stephen, the persecution of the Christian church. Remember, Paul hated Christianity. And like Elimus, he opposed the work of God. He stood against it. And he too was struck blind for a time. Remember that? And he too needed to be led by the hand by others. Maybe that's why he leveled this curse this way. Because he knew how the perfect demonstration of God's power exposing his weakness and wrongness might lead or could lead to true and everlasting change. It did for him. It did for him. Because Paul, before his Damascus Road experience, used to be like Elimus. And now, he's like Jesus. God has made him like Jesus. And Christian, you and I used to be like Elimus, didn't we? Spiritually blind, living for ourselves, before the Lord mercifully opened our eyes and compelled us to see him and called us to live for him. As Tim alluded to in his prayer, called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, that we might proclaim the excellencies of him. Oh, we were like Elemis once. And non-believer, you are like Elemis. You're scrambling to keep a way of life you think you need and you must have, which you will inevitably be powerless to keep. And God would like you to see today, through this text, the real limits of of what you can do by yourself. And the sheer worthlessness, the deceit, the bankruptcy of the world's ways that lead to death. Forsake them. Forsake them. Choose Christ and live. We don't know what happened to Elimus. The Bible doesn't say. There are some traditions, but I don't know how reliable they are. We know he heard the gospel and he had an opportunity to put his faith in Jesus. And at least initially, we know he chose not to. As one source put it, both Sergius and Elymas had heard about the teaching of the apostles. And this aroused the curiosity of Sergius and the fear of Elymas. Both of them heard the same gospel and in one arouses curiosity in another fear. It is fear that keeps us from coming to Jesus very often. We're afraid to give ourselves up, afraid to give up our life, our way. What does the good news of Jesus arouse in you? That brings us to the last point. Regarding the gospel, some people will be open to it, some people will be opposed to it. And finally, some people will believe it. Amen? Amen? Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. I got to tell you, when I read that, I thought, astonished at the teaching? I'm astonished at the miracle. I, I'm amazed by the miracle. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be what moves somebody? You'd think that, that that would be what the proconsul would be convinced by, but Luke is so very careful here so we don't get confused because we are easily confused. At least I know I am. Miracles are not the story. Miracles affirm the story. Jesus is Lord. Jesus was killed. Jesus was buried. Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus lives forever. 
Jesus reigns over all. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. Darkness is reserved for those who persist in opposing him. Light and life for those who will bow to him. You might think a Roman proconsul is kind of an unlikely convert, kind of unlikely to, to believe. What does he need? Why would he be convinced? But friends, we should never underestimate the power of the gospel. And we should never presume to know who would embrace it. Shame on us if we do. Even those of high status, intelligent people, government officials can be one with the truth of the forgiveness that is available in Christ. They can be saved. God turned Paul around completely. Don't forget that. He took the church's greatest enemy and made him the church's greatest missionary. He can turn anyone around. He can turn anyone around who will receive him. And you never know who the Lord will call to change. And you never know who the Lord will direct you to or call you to speak with. To give the message of salvation. So let's wrap it up. I, be ready. Just be ready. Keep preaching the Lord Jesus. Some people will be open to it. Others will oppose it. Some will believe it. And I want you to trust that someone out there needs you needs your bold proclamation, needs your, maybe even your confrontation. It was not acceptable to Paul that souls should perish and be eternally condemned. Beloved, may it not be acceptable to us as well. Some people will believe you. Some people will believe when you tell them about Jesus. And so you know, your Sergius Paulus awaits. Let's bow our heads in just a moment of quiet reflection and response. Maybe in light of that, we could just think for a moment. Who is your Sergius Paulus? Who is the person the Holy Spirit will lead you to, to share good news? even to confront bad news. Who is the person that for some reason in your mind you've de determined he'll never believe? She would never receive. Be challenged today. Find that person. Maybe even now the Spirit brings a name to you, a situation. Would you trust that? Would you pray for the Lord to open those doors? Would you be courageous to share the gospel? Someone out there needs you to do it.